We've already had a great feast today from the Word of God. I have heard around already that the elective Sunday school classes have encouraged people, beginning to teach people for the summer. I think that's, that's wonderful. Got to take the Lord's table. I'd like to share with you something really truly from my heart tonight is really a good practice of a pastor to move through the Word of God through Scripture and context as we have in Colossians. I like to do that. Expository preaching, as you well know. Uh, I like the idea of what we've been doing on Sunday nights by taking a specific topic uh, like the resurrection and how it applies to your life uh, through the Sunday evening services, and that's been good as we work through the epistles and see really the down-to-earth uh, grassroots of how the, the resurrection applies to us. But every once in a while, the Lord intercepts a pastor's mind and uh, moves it in a direction, takes him in a different direction than what he is preaching. Uh, and I hope that I'm sensitive to that, and I, I, I hope that our other pastors here will be sensitive to that also. Tonight is one of those sermons through my own walk with the Lord and the interaction specifically of, of one believer uh, in our church. The, uh, the Lord has kind of led me to preach this message, I believe, and it's called Preparing Your Heart for the Filling of the Holy Spirit. Preparing Your Heart for the Filling of the Holy Spirit. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll preach the word. Father, I ask that you would please honor your precious word and these things which are so necessary to preach. Lord, first of all, I want to thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who did not leave us without a comforter. I thank you for that paraclete that comes alongside of us, that lives within us. It is truly the spirit of Christ, the individual third person of the Trinity, but yet uh, God and one. I thank you that the spirit is within us. Lord, I, we talk a lot about him. We, we really just need him to control us, to fill us. And I pray, Lord, that you would use this message. Uh, Lord, that in your strength we would preach the word. And I thank you for what a good Sunday it's been already. We just praise and glorify you for the body of Christ being able to come together and love each other and to live life together. You're a good God. I thank you so much for your help, your guidance, your working in our lives. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Ephesians chapter 5, please. You may have already turned there. I saw some of you connect pretty quickly to what we were going to preach. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. While you're turning there, let me just, just say this and I'll, I'll keep going. Thank you for those of you, many who have been very responsive to the financial meeting that we had uh, a few Sundays ago. And if you were not here, that link was sent out to you. It's a private YouTube link that has that, uh, the video clip of that financial meeting. If you would like to have it, ask at the sound booth and those guys will, will get you a DVD of it if you don't have access to the internet. And uh, many of you have been very positive and very responsible, responsive and responsible. So praise the Lord for that. Would you stand please? Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 beginning in verse number 15. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse number 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, or uprightly, righteously, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, buying back the time, that means, or making good use of the time, because the days are evil. Would you agree with me that our society, our culture in these days are evil? Would you say amen to that? Okay, I just want to make sure you're alive. Verse 17, wherefore be not, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, that is. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You may be seated. Here's a very familiar passage. I hope that it will not breed contempt in your heart. We've preached it before. This familiar passage contains one main command. It is an illustrative, an illustrative command that is taken off of the illustration of someone who is a drunk, a drunken person. It says, be filled with the Spirit. There are three 
uh, sub commands or following commands underneath it that give direction. You have direction about the main command. These three things that you see in the next verses, they directly connect to the first command, be filled with the Spirit. And we'll talk about that in a moment. The three commands, sub-commands are speaking in music, giving thanks, and submitting yourselves mutually. Now many of you would look at these three commands underneath in these verses, beginning in verse number 19, and you would look at, at them uh, following be filled with the Spirit as consequences or evidences when the Spirit fills you, of this is what happened when the Spirit fills you. And there are certainly commentaries and uh, scholars, Bible scholars, that would support that idea, but I think there's much more here. I, I don't think that is what's going on here. It's not just this is what it looks like when the Holy Spirit fills you. I believe these things are given to us and they're connected in such a way grammatically in the grammar that they're given to us in ways that we can engage in mutual yielding to the Holy Spirit to prepare our heart for that Holy Spirit of God to fill us, to have full control of us. See, the command is given, and then these are sort of how-tos. There's no way it can be done on your own. There's no way that you can demand it of the Holy Spirit, but these are preparations of the heart that open the door, that allow, that Provide your heart, your life as obvious filling, obvious desire for the Holy Spirit to fill you. If these were, were just consequences of being filled with the Spirit, like if it told you to be filled with the Spirit, and here are the consequences if a person is filled with the Spirit. We already have those consequences. They're called the fruit of the Spirit. If, if it was, these are the consequences of being filled with the Spirit, it would be a repetition of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc., like we see in Galatians 5 and we see in, in verse number 9 of the same chapter, but that's not what's going on. It's not talking about just the evidences or the consequences of being filled with the Spirit. No, there's more here. These are ways for you to engage, to co-engage with the Holy Spirit, to have control of you. There, there are ways to prepare or to open or to invite the Spirit to control you. This is not, I don't believe, an exhaustive list of you do these things and the Holy Spirit will fill you. There is no such thing. The relationship with God is a relationship. It is not this, do this list of things, I'll write this book and make a million dollars. You know, it's not like that. And some preachers have fallen into that trap in the past. If you do this list of things, then the Holy Spirit's going to fill you. Well, well <clears throat> you know, that's like saying, if I do these list of 10 things, then my, my wife will love me more than anything in all the world. Okay, a relationship doesn't work that way. A relationship between two people is dynamic. It's, it's organic. It is alive, okay? These are preparations of the heart, not a list of to-dos. These things are hard attitudes that, that say, Holy Spirit, I want you to, you know, I am the car, you be the driver. I, I, I will live as a Christian, but you have got to control me. I, I want you, I invite you to control me, that I would not control myself. Major heart attitudes here, inviting the Spirit to control you instead of flesh. Now let's stop there a minute. Let's pull the brake. <coughs> Emergency brake. <clears throat> There's, you, you're a if you are, and I trust that you are, a born-again believer, there's only two entities that can control you, can fill you. Okay, you cannot be possessed by the devil. That's an impossibility. You can be oppressed. You cannot possess what is the property of the Holy Spirit of God, your body. Okay? So there's only two people that can fill me, that can control me in that way. It's either the Holy Spirit or it's me. It's either flesh controls me or the Holy Spirit controls me. There is no one else. Let's get some things settled from the Word of God biblically before we delve into this passage. Number one, there is a Holy Spirit. I know it's going to shock some of you. Sometimes I believe believers are like those people in Acts, in early Acts. We know not whether there be a Holy Spirit or not. Listen, that's a sad place to be in if you are born again Christian. There is a Holy Spirit who is a separate person of the Godhead who indwells, <clears throat> he seals, and he baptizes believers into salvation the moment they are saved and never leaves them. Not in the Old Testament as he came and departed uh, on believers. In the New Testament since Pentecost, we are, we are sealed, <clears throat> we are baptized, we are birthed, regenerated that is, by the Holy Spirit of God the Holy Spirit is in you if you're a born-again believer, whether you know it or not. 
Romans nails this very clearly. There are some that preach a second work of grace, that preach a second, you know, baptism of the Holy Spirit that is not salvation, that is beyond salvation. Well, Romans nails it. The Word of God tells you very clearly this. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Holy Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Did you understand that, okay? You cannot be saved and not have the Holy Spirit. If you are saved, you will have the Holy Spirit. If you have not the Holy Spirit of God, you are none of his. The Holy, excuse me, the New Testament truth is this. The Holy Spirit indwells us the moment He lives, comes to live inside of us the moment that we are saved. And if he is not in us, we are none of God's. We are not God's. Number two, biblical thing we need to settle. The Holy Spirit is the same powerful Holy Spirit at Pentecost and in the book of Acts. He has not changed. He is not different. He can work as powerfully now as then. Do not marginalize the work of the Holy Spirit Do not run away from what the Holy Spirit may do in you, even in worship. Be willing and open to the Spirit of God. He worked more visibly and outwardly miraculous in the purity of the apostles. We know that by real experience. And let me say, I hope that our our, our church is very open to the Holy Spirit. The sign gifts were given at the time of the apostles. The miracles, the speaking in tongues that the gospel may go forward was given specifically for a jump start of the gospel. But I hope that we would know that the Holy Spirit of God is here at Lighthouse Baptist Church. I hope that we would be open to be moved in whatever the Spirit of God wants us to be moved in, to, to, uh, to worship or to, to serve or any direction that he would like, us, uh, like to take us. But I, I guess the point is that it's the same Holy Spirit that works powerfully to illuminate the word, to comfort us when we should not be comforted, to to prompt us to work spiritually in us through our spiritual gifts. It is the Holy Spirit when one believer interacts with another believer and that believer is changed by the action of the gifts of the first person. That sounded like a legal document. I don't know where that came from. Number three, the indwelling, the sealing, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit that happened at salvation is not the same thing as walking in the Spirit and the synonymous term, filling of the Spirit. Let me say that again. Through the Scriptures, Romans, Galatians, the baptism of the Spirit, the birth, the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, the sealing, that is, He becomes our earnest until the day of salvation, that is different than daily walking in the Spirit. We can live in the Spirit. In fact, we're told, if, since you live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Here we are told to be filled with the Spirit. And I'm gonna show you in, in a moment, the, the grammar is, that, which praise the Lord that he, that he chose to give the New Testament and Koine Greek because it is very immense in the way that it talks. It is keep being filled with the Spirit. Be being kept filled with the Spirit is literally what, what the Lord is saying here. It is a multiple thing. It is a daily thing. It may be a momently, a momently, yeah, thing. Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 25, that same passage says this. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. See, the, the Spirit of God is present in you. You live in the Holy Spirit. You got him the day you got saved. Since that is true, let us also walk in the Spirit. Or be filled with the Spirit. Since he is in us, we need to have him have full control of us. Amen? Is that right? All right. Number four, biblical point to settle. Being filled with the Spirit isn't getting more of the Spirit. You have all of the Holy Spirit that you will have till the day of redemption. Okay? It is well to think of it this way. It is the Holy Spirit getting more of me is not me getting more of him. He's in, he indwells me. I am his temple. I, he lives within me. It is that he would get full control of me, yielding all of myself to Holy Spirit's control. In the early church, that was demonstrated through great wonders of tongues and prophecies and miracles. 
And it will be, I believe, redemonstrated that way according to the book of Joel in the tribulation time. At the end time, when the Lord comes again, men will prophesy and dream dreams, etc. But obviously, as in these verses, the, whole, the filling of the Holy Spirit stare there at verse number 18 and what follows there as the demonstration of it. Obviously, it is not talking there about when the filling of the Spirit comes, there is always miracles. You know, the demonstration here of how you can know that the Holy Spirit is filling you is when he is controlling you. In the three sub-commands, these things of speaking and music and, and submitting and, and giving, living in an attitude of thanks, that is that the Spirit of God is controlling me. And, and that is, I guess, miraculous to, live, to be able to live constantly thankful in a cruddy world. But it's not miraculous in the way that we would think. So when we talk about the, the, the filling of the Holy Spirit, some people get a little funny. You know, a little, you know, a little, you know, a little strange about it. But the filling of the Spirit is, that is demonstrated in these verses is straightforward that the Lord, the Holy Spirit would have full control over me. So verse number 16 through 18 then starts off. As you look there, please stare with your eyeballs there a little bit, that we as believers need to buy back the time, to redeem the time, because we're living on this earth in a terrible, wicked culture all around us. And it is the will of the Lord that we don't, we don't live like that culture, that we do not live to the flesh of what my flesh wants to do, lust of the eyes, you know, the pride of life, lust of the flesh, the pride of life, that I don't live that way. I redeem the time. It's the will of God that I buy back that time and live circumspectly or righteously, not satisfying my flesh. When it makes the application in verse number 18 about and be not drunk with wine, it is just coming right through that thinking. Wickedness all around you, don't live like that, live circumspectly, you know, know what the will of the Lord is, and what is wise and what is unwise, don't be drunk with wine where is an excess but be filled with the Spirit. The extreme example here of what it is like when you are totally controlled by the flesh is when you are a drunken sop. When you have so given yourself to your flesh that you are willing to drink yourself silly. It says don't, don't be that way. Don't be controlled by what your flesh feels or wants. Rather, walk uprightly. Rather, do the will of God. Rather, be filled, be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Of course, the picture is drawn of the filling of liquor or the filling of the Holy Spirit. Both of them control a person very strongly. I don't want to imagine drunkenness on any any believer here tonight. Several of you have come out of that, in fact. I trust that you are far from that, and I can give you solid biblical verses on not drinking at all. You know what a terrible thing that is to your testimony, what that is, and how dangerous that is to you and to your family. But this drunkenness is just an extreme way of saying, don't be controlled by your flesh. You know, use your time on this earth wisely, but rather, and and the way that you do that is be controlled by the Holy Spirit in you. Listen, every day you and I make a decision of whether we are going to allow flesh to control us or the Holy Spirit to control us. Every day, believers uh, default naturally to the flesh. It is not long before my flesh in early times of the morning wants to take control. Okay, default mode. All right, live for me. Live for Toby. You're just the same way. Well, not live for Toby, whatever your name is. That's kind of a default, I think. But there needs to be a decision made that you're not going to be filled with yourself and your flesh. You're not going to let flesh run you. You're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God that indwells you. Believers default to be controlled by self and our attitudes, our joy, our lack of it, the way that we treat others, selfishness. Uh, easily offended. So many believers, including myself, are living outside the will of God, drudging through life without joy, without abounding, without living uh, only, or without living by the power of the Holy Spirit, but only the power of the flesh, living in the control of the flesh with obvious lack of Holy Spirit filling and controlling me. How many believers, how easy it is for we as believers to give ourselves to ourself. The evidence of the fruit of the Spirit is sketchy at best in the way that I live the day. Now, I don't think any believer wants that. I sure don't want that. Do you want that? No, you don't want to do that. You don't want flesh to control you, do you? From youngest to old here, I hope that you see it is a miserable way to live when you're living for yourself. It's not always 
evidenced when I'm living by the flesh, it's not always evidenced by something big like drunkenness. It's not always evidenced by, you know, some fleshly thing. I'm living in fornication or adultery. Sometimes living by the flesh is very subtle. Sometimes living for the flesh, living in the control of the flesh, is hardly even seen. It's not always this great unrepentant sin that keeps the Holy Spirit from controlling and filling me. I believe in many cases it is is simply the need to get self out of the way and prepare your heart for the control of the Holy Spirit, to invite him to control, to seek after that, to ask not only to live in the Holy Spirit, but to walk in the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit, to be controlled by the Spirit. Listen, you're not only promised that that can happen, you're commanded to let it happen, to be filled with the Spirit. The command then in verse number 18, to be filled with the Spirit, as I said, is a continual passive verb. Literally translated as be being kept filled. And you know that at least part of it is your responsibility because you're commanded to do it. It's not something that's going to overtake you in the parking lot when you leave. It is something that you engage in. You are a co-engager with the Holy Spirit in. This is ongoing, repetitive, continual filling of God's Spirit. It's not necessary as we see right here. It's not necessarily, and I just say that for the sake of Pentecostal or charismatic teaching, it's not necessarily marked by some great emotional response. It's really marked by submission to letting the Holy Spirit lead lead you. These three heart preparations then from verse 19 to 21 play into that willing and prepared heart. Yielding to the Holy Spirit has been taught in other places as a mutual effort. We're told we're commanded to yield. You're acting and he is acting And these three things are preparing your heart to allow him to rule. I don't know about you folks, but I I don't want to live days controlled by Toby. These are not profitable days. These are not God-blessed days. These are not joyful, victorious days when I'm in the lead. We leave for vacation tomorrow. I don't know, some of you know that, some of you don't. This is our family vacation we take about this time. There will, be no, there will be no accountability as far as a church or a church staff of guys who are around me. There'll be, there'll be no one who tells us, there's no one we have to be afraid that if we go to a certain place, we're gonna run into a church member. And there, there's no, you know, nothing like that at all. I don't want Toby to lead me on vacation. I want the Holy Spirit to lead me. You know, sometimes we make these decisions that we are going to live for self. Listen, can I urge you to higher and more noble things, to prepare your heart, to co-engage with the Holy Spirit that only he would lead you and fill you, that you would be filled by the Holy Spirit of God. Preparation of the heart starts this way. Number one, it's in the verses, speak to yourselves in music. Look at verse 19 speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. A spirit-filled believer is a singing believer. You say, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. Well, then get your wheelbarrow. You know, there's not, you know, it's it's just a total stereotype here. I love standing beside a believer who is singing congregationally so flat and off tune, but singing out for the Lord. You know, the Lord, you know, it's all translated in this Holy Spirit thing, and it sounds beautifully harmonious to the Lord because it's coming from melody from his heart. Sing the praises of God, whether he, you can carry a tune or not. This is an action thing. This is an engaging and preparing my heart and opening up to the Holy Spirit of God who is full of praise and music. The Holy Spirit is not going to run you over to start singing God's praises. Well, I'll start singing when the Holy Spirit moves my heart. No, you move your heart and let the Holy Spirit have control of you. How about that? You need to open your lips and do it. Pick up your instrument and prepare your heart for the Spirit's control. The music is biblical music here. It, these, are, these are words and these are songs of the Lord. It is, it is starting in your inner man. Verse number 19, notice, look, it says melody in your heart. This singing outwardly begins in your heart. You know, you say, well, I don't have a song in my heart. Well, that's the point. This is a command. You're supposed to just open your mouth, open your heart, and start singing. You're supposed to encourage the Holy Spirit's control of you by singing, whether you feel like it or not. 
The Holy Spirit wants to sing in your heart and in your body. He wants to come out of you to encourage others by music, by spiritual singing with others and to others. You notice what it says there, speaking to yourselves. And most of you know this. This is not talking about the melody doesn't stay in your heart. You bless other people by that. That's what the Spirit of God wants to do. The music coming out of you, whether that is in private settings or, or whether that's singing up here and engaging in the choir or special music or whether that's you know, singing congregationally just along with everyone else. This is inviting the Holy Spirit to rule your heart. Music, the Lord is the Lord of music. And there's something about music that is directly connected to praise. How much different is this than a flesh-controlled Christian that has no melody in his heart, just a grumble in his heart, or just a selfishness in his heart? You know, the only music he gets, right? How different this is than a lady who is filled with only the songs of woe is me, negative mentality that fills herself only with, so, with no song or with worldly songs that, that only, you know, exalt self, that only bring your attention to self and rob her of the Spirit's control to God. Can I just tell you, really, you know, I, you know obviously you know if you've been here any amount of time that, you know, that we are... I don't try to preach to you or teach to you in such a small little nook that I would ever say, because there was no verse that would say this, that only songs that are directly spiritual in nature can be sung and everything else you're not right with God, okay? Refer to morning sermon on that. I mean, how could I sing Almost Heaven, West Virginia? Let's just be honest. Two times West Virginia was mentioned, amen. Okay, now listen to me. However, the preparation of the Spirit's control in your life you know, one way you can begin singing and praise the Lord in music. It is something that opens your heart to the right spirit and the right attitude that I'm not gonna control myself, I'm gonna control you, Lord. Have you ever had a day where you just, I mean, everything bad going on? You drop your toothbrush in the trash can or worse, in the toilet? I used to have this coffee maker. I know the devil was in the coffee maker. And I would start the coffee, and if you didn't put that in just a, the right way, all nine cups of coffee would pour all over the counter and down the counter. One time I was in the basement, and I saw it dripping brown. And what it was was my coffee maker upstairs. Now listen, sometimes things start like that. I want to tell you a way to prepare your heart so that you won't, your flesh won't get in control of you. You start singing to the Lord. You start praising the Lord. You get in that shower, and you fill it with praise of the Lord, and that car on the way to work, and humming a tune for the glory of God, thinking about the songs you sang on Sunday and repeating them, singing to the Lord. Again, these, these are heart preparations. You may need to begin singing, singing through sorrow or discouragement to invite the Holy Spirit's control of melody in your heart. I've often been at that place, but ended up rejoicing by turning my heart to music. Is that not what David did? You read the Psalms. Do you see how many of them start? Man, he's in the gutter and they end with him praising the Lord in song. Here's one of them, Psalm 42, verse five. It says, why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. He starts off in the gutter, why are you cast down? He, hen he ends up singing praises to the Lord by the end and giving his heart to the Spirit of God who will control his day and control his attitude and control his thought. So lift up your head and sing. Lift up your head and sing to the Lord. Sing to him. Open your heart to the Holy Spirit's control in you through the music of your inner man, the Holy Spirit that wants to sing out your mouth, wants to control you and sing from melody your heart to be a blessing even to others. That may be new to some of you. Let me recommend something to you. I would encourage you to buy a songbook as part of your personal devotional worship. I would encourage you to sing privately through uh, a, a song book, you know, at the beginning of a day, a picking of him and singing it. You don't have to sing it too loud so your wife hears it and all your kids hear it and all of that and your neighbor hears it and calls the cops. You, you sing as part of worship. It is a, an invitation for the Spirit to have control of you. There's a second preparation here. Notice, please, it says in verse number 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's a thankful attitude. Giving thanks always in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or say it this way, 
I need to keep the attitude to prepare my heart for the filling of the Holy Spirit of thanking, of being thankful for everything that Jesus has made possible in my life because of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Man, everything is, it, it, in, in the Christian life tethers back to what Jesus Christ did for us. You know, because of Jesus, it is all things working together for good. Because of Jesus, he has a plan and a purpose for my life. Because of Jesus, he brings people into my life and interacts with people at the church and people in my family and guides my home and all of those things. It's because of Jesus. An attitude kept in your heart of giving thanks invites the spirit to have control and to fill you. Now here is engaging in a thankful heart attitude that knows that all good comes ultimately from Jesus. Thanksgiving should be the aroma of your heart. Man, you're gonna have to fight this. You're gonna have to fight this. Because you know, some of you, I'm gonna be honest, I love you with all my heart. You know, you're not as young as you used to be. You know, you're like 10 years, you know, like almost 11 years older than when we first came here. Now I'm not aging, but you are. <laughs> and you got some aches and pains. Don't become a, a snarky old person. Can't praise the Lord anymore. You say, well, you know, when you get pains, you understand that too. I know, I'm going to try to practice my preaching. I'm sure that's true. And I'm the biggest baby among you. Some of you know that. We need to keep a thankful heart. A heart that really, you know, I've met some people and I've been tempted sometimes to think I deserve more. You don't deserve more. I deserve less. You deserve less. Anything that is good in your life is a great blessing. You deserve to be in the pit of hell. Be thankful. Be thankful for the big things and the little things. This verse in Colossians hit me a few weeks ago when we, when we preached. You know, this talking about thankful spirit. Do you remember, we even read it tonight in the Lord's Supper, where you come to the verse that says this, rooted and built up in Jesus or in him, and established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding therein or abounding in your faith with thanksgiving abounding abounding in your faith with thanksgiving sometimes it's hard to abound sometimes it's hard to just tolerate things in life with thanksgiving it is the lord's desire as we allow the holy spirit to control us and as we are firmly we firmly view the great things the Lord has done in our life that we would abound with thanksgiving. Even in the hard times. Abound is a word that means spilling over and springing up and dynamic and super abounding. This is how God wants our hearts to be in thanksgiving. Never wander far from the thoughts of the fact of what Jesus has done in your life through salvation that, that pours down in grace and blessings of your family and your church and, and gifts and in persecution and in trials that are all working together to turn you into gold that all have reasons. They are not random. You're not Psalm 1. You're not blowing like the chaff in the wind. Even your hardships are for exact reasons. He is, a, he is perfecting you into the image of Christ. It all is an incredibly detailed plan. When we get to heaven, I think we're going to be blown away by it. How every little thing worked together for what God is doing and you need to grab hold of that and be thankful and be thankful for what is going on in your life christians keep a thankful heart realize as i just said that you don't deserve what you have we deserve death and poverty and punishment but god blessed us the thankful heart is for all things in verse number 20 for the good and the bad that are working together and that thankful heart is an invitation you know what the thankful heart says holy spirit control me what does flesh say well, that shouldn't happen. I don't know why that happened. That person, I can't, I can't stand them being my life. Well, she got to be my teacher. I'm just diverging to youth a moment. Wish that guy wasn't in my youth group. I got this Pastor Josh thing. I'm just kidding. Wish this didn't happen. Wish I'd have that supervisor. Can't believe they put a center eye on the church. What are they thinking? It's a slippery slope. First the pastors leave the pole, and then they put a center eye. What's next? Be thankful. Be, keep a thankful heart, letting the Holy Spirit, not your flesh, run you. Thanksgiving is a heart attitude that hands the control of your life to the Spirit of God, to the filling of the Spirit of God. Be 
thankful. Be thankful. Do you remember Ron Hamilton and his song as cancer took his eye? Oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Keep a thankful heart. The last thing here is inviting, preparing your heart for the Holy Spirit's control. Submit yourselves mutually to each other. In verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. This is most often divided and connected to verse 22 as it talks about the marriage relationship, but it is connecting directly off of of being filled with the Spirit and these things, and that last thought there is submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord, and then it picks right up about wives submit yourselves. The bottom line is the filling of the Spirit, that selfishness places the steering wheel in the hands of my flesh. Selfishness wants me to get my way. Control of the flesh says, I am going to have my opinion listened to. Selfishness looks at the wills of others and chooses itself. When self is ruling, it's about you. Self will not subordinate yourself to anyone else. Self wants to hold on to the control of the steering wheel. When you won't submit or yield to others, but rather have a me first or a look at me attitude or my way attitude. The Holy Spirit is grieved. He's quenched inside of you. He's not driving anymore. He's not filling you. He's not controlling you anymore. Oh, he's living there, but he doesn't have control. One quick way you can find out if you're driving yourself is are you getting your own way all the time? Submitting yourselves is being in this verse is being a servant. Thinking better of others than yourself, giving way to the thoughts and the opinions and the wills of others around you, subordinating yourself under them. That's a hard thing, isn't it? It's a very hard thing, because we naturally want to grab a hold of control of ourselves. We naturally want to favor self. We want our feet washed. We don't, do, we don't want to wash anyone else's feet, naturally. We easily get offended when things don't go our way when we're not treated how we want to be treated. This verse says submitting yourselves, being a servant to other people, is giving the Holy Spirit opportunity to fill you. We prepare our hearts this way, the verse says in verse 21, notice the last phrase, in the fear of God. Now, now what does that mean? I, you know, we're talking about the filling of the Spirit, and all, all of a sudden it says do it in the fear of God. Submit yourself to, you know, be a servant. Bow down to other people in the way of submitting to them You know, all of a sudden it says in the fear of God. Who could be selfish to someone if they knew that God was standing there listening? Well, the fact of the matter, he is. The fear of the Lord, though, is not in the context of if I am not submitting to somebody else, the Lord's gonna take his hammer and crush me, okay? That's not what it is. The fear of the Lord here, this fear in the context, I believe, of 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 the Holy Spirit's filling of you is, is knowing that if I am not a servant to other people, if I don't submit myself to other people, if I demand my way, if I, my pride is coming out, the Spirit of God's not gonna control me. The fear of the Lord that he won't have control of you, that he won't be in control of you. This servanthood that puts others above you is preparing your heart for the Holy Spirit's filling. It is handing over control of yourself to the Lord. Now you gotta ask yourself, who do you want to control you tomorrow? Who do you want to be filled with? Your flesh, yourself, or the Holy Spirit of God? Here's three ways to prepare your heart to that. Please do not continue being a flesh-controlled Christian. There's no need for that. I pray that this place, Lighthouse Baptist Church, is filled with believers who say, I don't want the steering wheel Holy Spirit, you take it. I will, I will praise you in song. I will sing to others. I will sing to you. I will sing to the Lord. I will keep a thankful heart, letting you have control. I will thank you for everything that is going on in my life, whether I understand it or not. I will submit myself to others. I will not seek dominance. When I can, I'll give everybody else the bigger piece of pie. When I can, I will yield myself always to someone else, to others. I will be a servant like our Lord Jesus was. Holy Spirit, fill me. These are the preparations 
that the Lord put in Ephesians chapter five. He commands you to be filled with the Spirit and then he co-engages you to do it in these three ways. May we live daily in the filling of the Spirit of God.